Good morning, everyone, and welcome from Notre Dame, Indiana. This is 10 Years Hence. Nice to have you here. I'm James O'Rourke, a professor of management at the University of Notre Dame, and I've been your host for this series of talks. Thanks for joining us. Our speaker today is Danielle Citron, a legal scholar addressing the scourge of cyber harassment by raising awareness of the toll it takes on victims and proposing reforms to combat the most extreme forms of online abuse. Ms. Citron is Jefferson Scholars Foundation, Schenck Distinguished Professor in the Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. While she has explored a range of privacy and digital rights issues over the course of her career, much of her work has centered on gender-based discrimination in online environments where women are disproportionately targeted with threats of a violent and sexual nature. In her book, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, and a series of law review articles that informed it, Citron documents the significant harms caused by various types of cyber stalking, cyber mob attacks, and revenge porn, non-consensual publication and dissemination of intimate photos or videos, particularly those from a significant other seeking to humiliate a former partner. Professor Citron not only analyzes the social and legal structures that make it so difficult to curb cyber harassment, but also reframes the issue as a violation of civil rights. She received her BA from Duke University and a JD from Fordham University School of Law. She taught previously at Boston University and the University of Maryland as professor of law. She is an affiliate scholar at the Stanford Center on Internet and Society, an affiliate fellow at the Yale Information Society Project, a faculty associated, uh, sorry, a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law School, and a senior fellow at the Future of Privacy Forum. That's a lot. We hope to unpack much of what she's done by way of research and her current interests in a book that I understand she's writing at the moment. So good morning, Danielle. Welcome to 10 Years Hence. Thank you so much, Professor O'Rourke. I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, let me- Am I taking over, over now? Yeah, well, let me hand it over to you, but remind our, um, uh, our viewers that the Q&A function at the, uh, the foot of the page is there for you to enter a question if you like. We'll gather those up and in perhaps uh, 45 minutes time, we'll pass those along to Professor Citron. So for the moment though, I'll hand it to you and uh, I'll be right here. It's terrific um, to join you all. Um, and I'm a longtime friend of Notre Dame and especially the law school and the tech, tech ethics center. So it's great to be with you. So thank you, Professor Work, for having me. So I'm gonna talk today about my book, um, the, it's now called The Privacy Myth, How Intimacy Became Data and How to Protect It. And it grows out of my, I've, I'm a privacy scholar and free speech scholar, and it grows out of my work that I've been doing over the last, I would say, 10 years with lawmakers and with tech companies about issues that, a range of issues, but often about the collection of, of really what we consider sensitive information um, and about ways in which individuals um, deny people their privacy, often through, as, as Professor O'Rourke mentioned, the posting of their nude photos without consent, taping them non-consensually um, when they're undressing and having sex, and ways that we humiliate, shame, and, and crucially deny people of all of their important life opportunities. And over the 10 years that I've been working on these issues, whether it was with um, Kamala Harris when she served as the AG of California, with state lawmakers, um, with, with folks on the Hill, with tech companies like Twitter and Facebook, we often would deal with these issues sort of in silos. So, so one day we talked about how do we address hidden cams? Um, how do we regulate? How do, how do we have you know, stronger law enforcement around it? Um, what about the next day would be non-consensual pornography? We, we once never, we didn't have any laws that regulated the posting of nude photos without consent. Now we have virtually every state around the country have those have the laws and we have a, a proposal that's part of the violence against women act and but each day we sort of address these questions separately without a without a really clear-eyed view of the full interests at stake 
And so, um, and that often leads to sort of bad legislation, limited legislation, and stalled efforts, and also without a really clear eyed view of the harm. And so in my book, The Privacy Myth, I'm gonna be exploring why all of these different, and I'm gonna talk about the different ways in which we collect, use, and share, and exploit information about our intimate lives is actually one phenomenon. And it's one phenomenon that implicates our fundamental crucial rights um, and that needs protection, comprehensive, strong protection as a civil right. So let me explain what I mean by the term intimate privacy, because without that definition, we're sort of often having a conversation across purposes. But, but what I mean is um, access to and information about our bodies, our sex, sexuality, and gender, our health information, our most innermost thoughts, you know, desires and fantasies, and information and access to our closest relationships. And it covers all on and offline activities. It, it covers um, our interactions, our communications, our searches, and of course our, our interactions in real space. And, and intimate privacy, just to set the table as to why it's so important, um, it, there are three sort of pillars as to why we should care about intimate privacy. Um, and, and two of those pillars are, are re really harken back to when Sam Warren and Louis Brandeis got together, they were law partners in Boston in 1890. And Sam Warren recruited his, his law partner, Louis Brandeis, to write an article called A Right to Privacy. Um, and it became one of the most famous law review articles. And what they tackled was, in fact, intimate privacy. They talked about how the press and the newly emerging snap camera, the Kodak camera, enabled reporters to spy on households, um, to, to take people, take pictures of people when they were not expecting it, and often in domestic settings, so in the home, um, or walking into their home when they're unguarded, you know, they had their guards down. And Warren and Brandeis talked about the importance of the ability to control how one's intimate life, how um, their information about their sexual relationships and their personal relationships, what was whispered in the closet was being shouted from the rooftops and then reported on by, by reporters and photos included in the what was then the sort of gossip bags of the eight, late 1800s. And they called for a right to intimate privacy for, for privacy to be recognized in the tort law because they explained that it was so central to figuring out, so human agency, to figuring out who we are, right? When we have the right to control how our bodies and how our most intimate information is shared with others, we have a sense of, we can go backstage, we can let our guards down, we can be who we wanna be, right? We have a sense of sexual autonomy, we can develop ourselves. Like when we're not, fe we're not fearful of being watched and judged, then we have all the opportunities to kind of go backstage, to experiment with who we are, experiment with ideas. And then only then truly can we join, you know, uh, public discourse in a way that we are critical and independent thinkers as Hannah Arendt once wrote about. And there's another part of that kind of respect for autonomy that has everything to do with human dignity. When we afford, when we recognize, when we feel ourselves that we're in control of who has access to our bodies and our intimate lives, then we feel like we have respect for our choices, right? And our self-esteem. And not only is it respect for our, our own choices, right? In the sense that we're deciders, but also our social esteem, right? That is when we can make those decisions about who knows about our gender. Let's say we're experimenting with our gender, our sexual orientation. We are the deciders of who gets to know that information. And it could be, uh, it could be a number of people, but, but we decide the parameters and who knows and who's gonna keep that to themselves. Then we can present ourselves to the public at large as being whole, as being fully integrated and with integrity. And that's social respect, right? Both self-esteem because respect for our own choices and respect for ourselves as integrated whole people who aren't just the nude photo. You're not just your sexuality. You're your whole person, messy and complicated, right? But you're your whole person. Now that's the focus of what Brandeis and Warren were essentially talking about, the inviolate personality and respect for the inviolate personality. 
But intimate privacy also matters. It's so central to who we are because it is, as Charles Fried said, gosh, he wrote 1973, that privacy is the oxygen for intimacy. That without privacy, we um, would have difficulty forming close relationships. And social psychologists have written and talked about how privacy, that is, you know, what, how love develops and how close friendships develop is through mutual self-revelation and mutual vulnerability. That when we have the sense that we have boundaries around our relationships, we can share and be exactly who we are in all of our honest self. And even with what we might understand as discrediting information, but we can share it with people that we care about on the premise that they're gonna treat our information as we hope rather than as we fear. And it's through that process, it's sort of like unpeeling an, an onion. It's through that process of self-revelation that we form and forge close relationships, both love relationships, right? As well as close friendships. And we can't do it without intimate privacy, without having the ability to manage the boundaries around our intimate lives. And in the 21st century, though, so those central things, the reason why we care about intimate privacy, it's respect for human agency, it's respect for human dignity, it's, it's necessity for intimacy and love. Those things are now most in threat. And I'm gonna explain the sort of three avenues where we're seeing those threats come from. And the first I'm gonna categorize or describe as spying incorporated, right? the business of collecting using and sharing our intimate information. And so I'm no technological naysayer. I want us to be able to use all of the tools that we have at our disposal, all the apps, all of the Alexas, all the health apps, right? The, the Apple iPhone and, and the health apps. I want us to use all of these tools, but I wanna have us use them with the privacy protections that we aren't currently afforded. So let me just describe how Spying Inc how our intimate information, so that's information about our bodies, about our sex, sexuality, and gender, information about our close relationships and our innermost thought is being collected, used, shared, and monetized in ways that we would never imagine, right? So I have to say every single person that we know likely has visited an adult site, right? Pornhub being just the most famous. And we often think, gosh, you know, there's no way that porn sites are collecting, using and sharing, not only the videos that we watch and how long we, we watch them, but mining information about us and what it says about us, right? Um, when we visit porn sites. And the, the truth of the matter is that not, over 92% researchers have found that 92% of all the porn sites, that all the adult sites that we visit have ad trackers. And those ad trackers create profiles about us. So not only like our fetishes, our desires, our searches on, on online sites, but also what it says about us, what our interests are. And they're selling, so advertisers, so every given adult site has on average seven trackers and those trackers then share them with data brokers, right? So our information collected on an adult site doesn't stay there, isn't used just for the purpose of advertising on that site, but is used to integrate and bought by advertisers and marketers and then further sold. So like sort of, as you think about information laundering, further sold to data brokers who include that information and profiles about us, right? Now, the same kind of intimate surveillance that's happening on adult sites is happening um, when we use search tools and, and check out, let's say, WebMD or patients like us. It's the same exact dynamic, the kind of sharing, using, and then ultimately mining and selling information about our most intimate, what we might think is the most sacred information, our health information, is being used in shared, scored, and ranked with data brokers. Often they're beta, data brokers devoted solely to health information. And you know, your, your fitness apps, right? So there, Alexa sells a halo, right? Which is a fitness band, which then is integrated into your phone. And that collects it and Wired Magazine um, called it best for so spousal harmony because it tracks your vocal, like your, the sound and meaning and tone of your voice whether you seem irritable or not. Now that might be okay, right? For you personally to use, to have a sense of course, of whether like maybe you shouldn't have that kind of tone with the person you're talking to, right? But, but mining information and storing information about our, 
our vocal patterns. Not only could it be junk science, frankly, um, but it also is being used to make important determinations about our lives. Whether we're depressed, that information is then sold and shared with and marketed with data brokers, right? So, so as much as these, these tools are, have meaning for us and they're important to us, they were used in ways that we wouldn't expect and that I think have troubling implication and lack of legal protection. And last for spying, Inc., I'll just share that, of course, dating apps. You know, most young people are on dating apps. Um, and Judith DePortal, who's a, a journalist for, for, for The Guardian, wrote a story about how, you know, she used um, Tinder and it collected a lot of information about her. And she met lots of interesting people over the course of a year. And when she asked Tinder for under the general, the, the general data protection regulation in Europe, she lives in the UK. And at the time could ask and still can ask Tinder for the records of what, you know, everything they collected about her. What landed in her lap was 800 pages of printed material. All of the text she sent, information about the kinds of men she was interested in, their gender, their sex, their racial background. Um, the, there's an enormous amount of information about her. And what she explained that when she had that data sitting on her lap, the 800 pages, was that Tinder knew more about her deepest and darker, sex, you know, deepest sexual fantasies and desires than she even knew about herself. And when she checked on Tinder's privacy policy, she saw that they explicitly explained that we're selling all this information to advertisers and that if it was then sold onward, that was on those advertisers, right? Not on Tinder. And that's true of most and all dating sites, including the gay dating app Grindr, Scruff, Jacked, et cetera. And of course, all these dating apps are used around the globe. So our information, so Spying Inc. is the business of surveillance of our intimate lives that in the United States is, is largely unprotected. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second, the sort of legal framework, but that's just one area that our intimate lives are under surveillance and being monetized. Um, and we do see, you know, my focus often is on the way in which both gender and race and minorities have a disproportionate impact on their lives for surveillance um, and that's true in, in the Spying Inc. in the sense of uh, one out of three women and girls use health apps. That includes period tracking and menstrual tracking apps, fertility apps, um, as opposed to boys and men who are less likely to use them. And the surveillance of her intimate life and the sale of that information is just as rampant as it is on adult sites and dating sites and health apps. Um, so we are seeing, and, and insurance companies are in the business of facilitating women at work using fertility tracking and menstrual tracking apps. And the rationale is, oh, it'll make your life easier when you come back from pregnancy leave. How can we help you? But the truth of the matter is the metrics they're using are really not designed to help women in the workplace, but rather to help save costs for insurance companies and employers, no surprise, right? But, but when we use them, we often don't realize that. Okay, so that's spying ink, the first kind of category and ways in which our intimate lives are under surveillance and display. The second are what I call spies. That's individual privacy invaders, right? And the problem that we see is, is particularly acute. All, it's all over the globe. That, that what we might think is, oh, that's really an American problem. It's not at all. I've been working with lawmakers in South Korea, in Australia, in the UK, in Israel. And the problem that we see in the United States is echoed throughout the globe. And that what we're seeing is that privacy invaders are particularly focused on spying on, exploiting, extorting, manufacturing, so we'll get to deep fakes in a second, um, and then displaying um, intimate information, especially nude photos, of, and more often women and sexual minorities. And so how are we seeing that? Like, what are, what's the spying look like? And I'm just gonna describe different ways that we see privacy invaders um, uh, take advantage of individuals and those indivi the, the spies could be strangers. They're more often intimates or people we know, friends and acquaintances, but strangers also get involved in the act. And what they're doing is first kind of category is video voyeurism. So made so much easier by the sort of size, miniature size of hidden cameras and the facility for those hidden cameras 
have Wi-Fi connection and then streaming to the internet. So what we see, in, and I'm just gonna describe in South Korea, it's called Molka and it's named after, and I think frankly trivialized by a TV show like um, uh, about hidden cameras. So that's the name Molka. And what we see in South Korea is that in women's bathrooms, public bathrooms, we see an extraordinary amount of hidden cameras that then um, those hidden cameras are then streamed to the internet. So it's women going to the bathroom urinating, taking down their pants. Um, and women in South Korea buy what they're called Molka kits. It's, a, for, um, it's approximately $20. Um, and what, it, what you can do is when you go to the bathroom, uh, the idea of a Molka kit is there's silicone that you can put in any crevices that where there might be um, hidden cameras. So the phenomenon is such that women feel like when they use a public bathroom, often they won't use it because they're afraid. But when they do, they, they engage in sort of self-help procedures, which is frankly absurd, right? Um, and the phenomenon of hidden cameras is, is not unique to South Korea. The story of South Korea is the story of Singapore, is the story of, of Berkeley, California. So, you know, there have been repeated cases of not only Berkeley students using cell phones um, to, to hide in women's bathrooms to tape um, fellow students, but also uh, maintenance individuals like hiding and buying for 20 bucks a hidden camera and a smoke detector. Um, they range from, if you go on Amazon, you can find an array of, of hidden cameras in um, smoke detectors, in, in um, alarms like that you would never expect that are then Wi-Fi enabled. They're incredibly inexpensive. They used to be really, they were used to be pricey and now it's really cheap prime delivery included. And so they're rampant um, all over the globe. So that's the first way. So, so video voyeurism. And I think included in that, we can describe the practice of upskirt and down blouse photos. So that's individuals taking photos using their, often their cell phones or watches with embedded um, cameras or sneakers with embedded cameras. That's like a thing, they're very available. They're not that expensive. And taping photos or making videos up women's skirts or down their blouses. So highlighting areas of the body that we think are largely clothed, that people are using you know, their cameras on their phones or even pens to secretly tape women down their blouses or up their skirts. And it's a phenomenon. Again, Mayer in Germany caught doing it with hundreds and hundreds of pictures on his laptop that he had taken um, when women were riding escalators. We see it everywhere, the phenomenon of upskirt and down blouse photos. Then there's something called sextortion, which is the, and, the, and it's often, it's most often targeted at children. So individuals under the age of 18. Um, and when, when, when adults are targeted, it's women and boys and girls. And the process is you trick someone into sharing a nude photo of you. So you pretend to be a handsome looking or good looking woman and you trick a kid into giving their nude photo. And then what you reveal yourself and you say, well, now that you shared a nude photo with me, you have to share more. You have to tape yourself masturbating. You have to send me those videos. And if you don't, I'm gonna share the nude photos that you shared with me with your parents. I'm gonna post them online and I'm gonna humiliate you. And if you tell anyone about it, I'm gonna kill your parents. And perpetrators have thousands of victims. So now you can have one perpetrator and that perpetrator has victims, hundreds of victims around the globe. It's so easy now, right? With, with unfortunately, with our capabilities that we have today. Um, and so that is called sextortion. Um, and it is unfortunately a rampant problem. Okay. Then there's non-consensual pornography, right? Which was just something I've worked on for a really long time. And that we now I mean, increasingly, I think have an awareness of it. And that's the posting of nude photos of someone without their permission. And we often see intimates um, usually it's men asking women to share um, intimate images of themselves and on the, on the theory and on the promise that those photos will be kept private, right, in a, in a relationship. And when the relationship dissipates, whether it's as a, as a mode, whether motivated by power, by spite, by showing off, right, those photos are then posted online. And what we have is an entire industry 
Um, there are sites, there are over 9,000 sites that are devoted to revenge, what's called revenge porn. It's an inapt description because it's not always due to revenge. We often as advocates call it non-consensual pornography, but it is there, there are sites devoted to the posting of people's like hidden cams and nude photos. Most often, I'd say over 90% of the photos are of women and girls um, and not of men. Um, and, and the sites make money, like their raison d'etre, their business model is the posting of nude photos without consent. Now, some of them aren't even that racy, right? It's not because pornography, which is consensual, is, is more often reveals so much more, right, of one's body. Um, but what is considered salacious is the fact that it's non-consensual. And these sites have contests. Um, so that it becomes a game. What you see in the comments and in the sort of the, what the site operators say of themselves is that like the most, and there'll be like titles for various contests, like sexy ex-wife, you know, I'm going to be quite tame in how I describe this, but it's usually very racially and, and, and demeaning both by race and by sex and sexual minorities, that that these contests are sixty dollars for you know third place winner of most liked photo and most commented photo to two hundred fifty dollars. And you might say to me, Danielle, how is this even possible? Right? How is it that businesses can be can, their, their that their business model can be illegality? Right? And the answer is. Section 230 of the Decency Act, which provides an immunity to site operators in the United States for hosting user-generated content. So I'm gonna get further into that when we talk about the law, but that's why we have an entire industry that's built around abuse because they get to say, hey, post all this information. We're not responsible. You are, and the fact of the matter is that the posters, it's they're very difficult to find, law enforcement aren't interested, and so no one is held responsible. Okay, so that's non-consensual pornography. Um, and the last, and this is something that Professor Rourke, I know has been a theme of the, the talks this, this term, um, is deep fake sex videos, right? So, so you might say, okay, what is that, right? Those, we know that deep fake technology allows the creation or manipulation of videos that have you doing and saying something that you never did or said, right? That's the sort of nature or art of deep fakes. And where do they begin? No surprise, like anything internet, it begins in porn. So deep fake sex videos is where the phenomenon, the name comes from 2018, a Reddit user, a computer scientist by day, and then a tinker by night, posts on Reddit a technology that he says will allow anyone to insert celebrity females' faces into porn. And the subreddit blows up, right? It has postings like hands over fist postings of you know, famous female celebrities, their faces inserted into porn. So Gal Jadot, um, uh, you know, you name the celebrity, their photo is being their images is in, are inserted into porn. Um, and so that's the phenomenon of deep fake sex videos. And a sensitive uh, security researchers have found that there are over 80,000 deep fake videos online and 96% of those videos are deep fake sex videos. And over 98% of those videos are of women's faces being inserted into porn. So it's very gendered, right? There's just no demand for fake porn about male celebrities. There's a demand for porn, fake porn, for female celebrities and for everyday women, right? It's not just the celebrity uh, who's, on whose shoulders this falls. It's female journalists. Um, it is just the everyday young person. Um, and it's, it can be life destroying when the deep fake sex video appears in a Google search of your name. Okay, so that's the phenomenon of the spies, right? And, and what I thought I'd do right now is just to describe a little bit of the harm that we see to individuals. And that is, you know, the harm of course is um, for people who have been secretly taped um, um, in the bedroom or undressing, who like uh, someone I wanna talk about in my book. I, for my book, I interviewed 46 people from around the globe um, uh, to talk to me about their experiences. And Joan, um, I'm gonna describe her as Joan, is a young lawyer who was staying at a hotel in New York um, for business. And um, after she stayed, she got an email 
from someone saying, I taped you when you were in the shower um, at the hotel room. And I'm going to post this video of you online unless you provide more nude images. And Joan got in touch with me and asked me what to do. And I said, you absolutely are not going to give this person more content. Um, and then the person posted the videos on Pornhub and other adult sites. And every time that Joan would then ask Pornhub, who was the most, they were the most helpful of all the adult sites, but every time, uh, and they weren't that helpful, but every time the video would be taken down, more would go up. And then Joan would receive more emails that more um, videos would be posted online about her without her permission. And then when Joan refused to email the person back, the person then sent the video to her law school classmates and her colleagues, ostensibly because they figured out who she was on LinkedIn, found all of her contents and shared all of those videos. And as Joan explained to me, you know, she had a job, she was lucky, right? But the idea that she had to tell her employer what was going on was devastating. And the fact that her law school classmates and her colleagues at work had seen the video of her undressing and showering and going to the bathroom was devastating. Like it shook, she knew that's how they would see her as just a body. Right? She, was, she was incredibly embarrassed. And there were opportunities that she just did not apply for. There was a clerkship she was thinking about applying for and she thought, how can I do that? In a Google search of my name are these videos. I try to take them down, but I can't like whack them all. I can't take them down. And she just felt like her whole world was destroyed. That there, she had no sense of safety, right? She would say, God, my iPhone was acting wacky today. And I felt like, oh no, this person is in my iPhone. So your sense of safety, like how you feel about yourself and how you feel about the world around you is hijacked. And she felt like she had to check the internet. There was no time in which she wasn't always checking to see what you know, other she was dropping, how else he might, and he manufactured some videos as well with her full name in the caption. And so she just felt the torment was never ending. It sort of like took up, uh, it was the incurable disease as, as, a, as a victim of non-consensual porn sort of has descri had described it to me. Um, and so because this, the process of, of invasions of, of intimate privacy fall on the shoulders of women and, and often sexual minorities. So there are webs, there are sites devoted to um, non-consensual pornography of gay, bi, trans men. Um, we see that the, then so do the professional consequences. So people have lost their jobs as a result. They're often blamed for the very project that the, the, they're suffering. So well, why do you share that nude photo? Um, what's wrong with you kind of thing. Um, and uh, it's, it's life changing and ending. And when they go to law enforcement, law enforcement's like, what, what was wrong with you? What were you thinking? Right? Like turn off your computer, nothing we can do. Right. Okay. We also see that governments are in the same sort of act or invasions of intimate privacy in the sense of like totalizing surveillance that says everything about our intimate lives that we often don't get permission for, you know, whether it's law enforcement or fusion centers have access to total surveillance tools that have total surveillance of our lives that tell us, that tell certainly law enforcement when we're going to psychiatrist, the plastic surgeon, right? Our lovers homes. So once you can track someone throughout their day, enormous amount of intimate information is in the hands of government. So you might say, okay, well, surely we have a lot of laws in the United States to help us with this. And I wish I could say that that's true, but it's not. That's particularly true in the United States. We're a scoff law in all sorts of ways, but particularly when it comes to intimate privacy, let's just take Spying Inc. We treat the collection use and sharing of intimate information as a consumer protection matter. And so the presumption is permission to collect, permission to use, permission to monetize and sell. And we, we really only have like sort of bare bones procedural protections for individuals. So what consumer protection laws will require, this often comes from state law, is that, that businesses have privacy policies. And that those privacy policies have to tell us what vaguely companies are doing with our data, but without much detail. And often, as my colleague Woody Hartzog would say, privacy policies are really, in effect, anti-privacy policies. They're telling us that they're collecting, using, and sharing our data and selling it to advertisers and marketers. Um, 
And he says, it's all a big, ugh, <laughs> right? A lack of protection. And you might think, okay, well, what about health apps, right? That's got to be covered by something like the health inf um, uh, health, inf health insurance uh, portability and accountability act, HIPAA. But that's an insurance portability act, right? It only has a sidecar of privacy protections. They're really narrow. They don't apply to health apps. They don't apply to your fitness bans. They don't apply to WebM WebMD. They only apply to health providers. So hospitals and doctors, you know, the, the business of providing healthcare, there are privacy regulations. So they've got you get your affirmative consent to collect your data and then to share it. You know, you do that when you go to the doctor's office, like sign this and you think, all right, I'm just gonna sign it. Often we don't know what we're signing, but what we're signing is just that we're giving explicit permission to use our information for the purposes of healthcare. So for paying for our healthcare and for the, you know, giving us healthcare. So that's sharing it with other doctors so long as they have our permission. But it's not about protecting the health information that we share online with WebMD or the Mayo Clinic when we go to their website or your fitness app or your Amazon Halo, right? It doesn't protect it. So in this consumer protection model in the United States, often I often say that the way that we protect privacy in the United States is sort of like how you know the Cayman Islands, the whole point is to protect businesses, not so much individuals, right? So we're scoff laws in that way. Outside the United States, we, they have stronger protections like the European General Data Protection Regulation. But in truth, those protections are really pretty procedural, right? They require, um, you need permission to collect data. So you can do it based on consent, affirmative consent or legitimate business uses. So it's not as if Europe has it figured out, right? They certainly have much more production than we do. So that's the spying ink, right? What about spies? How do we deal with that? And the first of the matter, the first thing is you think, okay, where's the deep pocket in all of this? What's the party in the best position to pressure to minimize the harm? And those are the online platforms. But Section 230 of the Decency Act passed in 1996 says that companies aren't going to be treated as publishers or speakers of somebody else's content. And the whole idea behind the Communications Decency Act was to incentivize what the statute calls Good Samaritans, so that platforms were in the business of self-policing. Because the Congress people, the two men, um, Ron White and Chris Cox, they knew that federal agencies couldn't do it all remotely, right, clean up the internet. And so they wanted to provide an incentive for companies to do it themselves and to act as good Samaritans, as the words of the statutes, good Samaritan blocking and filtering of offensive content. Now we've seen some good Samaritans, right? We've seen, we've seen online platforms have terms of service, have rules of the road. They may, they, they may be difficult to scale, but they're trying, right? To deal with offensive and scary bullying, harassment threats, that's the work I've been doing with Facebook and Twitter. But there are sites we know, I told you a little bit about, whose business is abuse, right? It's the revenge porn sites, the hidden camp sites, they're a dime a dozen. They make a tremendous amount of money off of non-consensual pornography at hidden camps. They, some are a subscription model, so it's $19.99 a month, um, or they make money through the advertising business. They are immune. They enjoy the legal shield of, the, of, of Section 230. And that's unacceptable, right? So that is where the United States is again, scoff law, right? It's lawless. So when the Danish police shut down one of the most famous revenge porn boards called Anon IB, they shut it down. Guess where it shows back up in two months? Hosted in Las Vegas, right? So truly as American pie as porn is, so is non-consensual pornography. What about perpetrators? And say, all right, well, can't get the platforms, but what about the individuals themselves? Now, unfortunately, the law doesn't approach this issue. And I've talked a little bit about what motivated my work on this book is that the law sort of deals with these issues as they come up, right? We look at video voyeurism, we try to tackle that problem. Not get into pornography, try to tackle it. Cyber flashing, try to tackle that one. Deep fake sex videos. But because we deal with them as silos, rather than as comprehensively invasions of intimate privacy, what happens is that the laws that come, if we're gonna have reform and it happens really slowly, if we have reform, 
because the lawmakers don't see the full view of the harm, they either do nothing and walk away from the problem because they say dead to me, next session, we'll deal with it. Sorry, we couldn't come up with an agreement. Or the laws that come out of committee that are passed are pretty weak. They're mostly misdemeanors and it's like a parking ticket. Right. And so what happens is law enforcement, it's really expensive to figure out who and the process of getting a warrant for an online service provider. And then you get an IP address and go to the ISP. It's a process that law enforcement just doesn't understand. And they're not given the reason to understand. It's a misdemeanor. They just don't spend the time and money to help victims. And so um, there may be laws on the books, but they're unhelpful. Um, and while we have privacy torts and um, other civil claims that victims can could in theory bring, in practice they don't, in part because it's really expensive to get a lawyer. And when they do get a lawyer, because I've helped them, there's the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Project that does pro bono work. It's the law firm k &L Gates. And then Foley Lardner is another firm that's helping with pro bono matters. Victims just say in the end of the day, like when lawyers ask, what do you want? They say, I want the perpetrator to stop. I want these pictures taken down and I don't wanna deal with them ever again. And unfortunately, when you bring a lawsuit, there are two features that are inescapable. And the first is you're engaging with the perpetrator. And so you might have discovery. We have to give over medical records to your perpetrator. You have to sit across from your perpetrator in a deposition. Victims just don't want that, right? And it's really expensive. So if you don't have pro bono counsel, you don't have a lawyer. And, and oftentimes you can't sue under a pseudonym. So when you, when you file a lawsuit, your name is in the caption and that for privacy victims, right? Victims of privacy violations, the last thing they want is to draw more attention to a privacy violation. And so the DAC is really stacked against victims being able to have some sense of justice in their own hands. Um, and so, you know, we have law isn't terrifically helpful, unfortunately, right? And so my argument at the heart of the book is that we need to see um, invasions of intimate privacy, whether it's spying ink, whether it's spies, whether it's government spies, right? We need to see it as a civil right. Now, modern civil rights laws, um, they're really anti-discrimination laws, right? We don't have a fully and sufficiently developed idea of what a civil right is. We just view them as they are prohibitions against discrimination. But if we go back to the 1780s, to Thomas Paine and Mary Wollstonecrantz, to think about what a civil right is, a civil right is a fundamental right to something that is essential for human flourishing and civic engagement. Um, and Robin West has argued that civil rights should be understood as rights owed everyone, right? Guarantees owed everyone because of how important they are. And the sort of early civil rights laws from 1866 um, had a sense of there were certain fundamental rights like the right to property and contract that were owed everyone and that couldn't be denied um, on the basis of discrimination and other forms of injustice. And so we ought to understand the civil right and recognize a civil right to intimate privacy that's owed everyone, that each and every one of us enjoys, but also of course, borrowing from the tradition of, of the modern civil rights laws, prohibitions against discrimination, because we see the disparate impact that invasions of intimate privacy have on women and minorities. So a civil right, we need to recognize in the United States, a civil right to intimate privacy, that's both a basic entitlement for each and every one of us to enjoy, so that we can use all of these apps, dating apps, porn sites, as much as we want because privacy and protections are provided, but also that, and I was just using spying as an example, but also there are protections against discrimination, that when we are a data broker tags us and we're classified as a rape victim, this is truth in fact, how data brokers classify us, or as an HIV sufferer, um, or, a bisexual or a sex toy user that, that won't be used against us vis-a-vis um, -vis if the discrimination is born out of stigma on the basis of, you know, we often see the bodies of women and sexual minorities and racial minorities as just inherently damaged. Um, and so if that's gonna deny you a job, that shouldn't be permissible. 
Um, and so I have in my book a reform proposal that is has uh, several pillars. And the first is premised on some legal changes. Um, first, in recognizing intimate privacy as a fundamental, as a civil right, owed entitlements to everyone and protections against discrimination, we often think of civil rights laws not only as a robust moral imperative, but they also come with robust protections and remedies. And that caretakers of spaces that implicate our civil rights have special duties to us, right? And so that would apply that sort of civil rights thinking and remedies would change how we think about the collectors of our information, of our intimate information, whether it's spying ink or revenge porn sites, right? That, that how we think of them, it would shift the and take away the permission that we now afford these. There's no rationale needed. You can collect, use, and share this information. There's also an immunity afforded. And that immunity uh, for site operators has to disappear, right? Not totally, we shouldn't get rid of it. But my proposal to change section 230 is we should not only exempt civil rights laws, that's first and foremost, but that when we afford the immunity, we should bring it back to the original purpose, which was to incentivize Good Samaritans. And so providers of interactive computer services, that's the language of the statute, should enjoy the immunity if they're engaged in reasonable content moderation practices in the face of clear illegality. And what that would do is change the incentives. Right now, there's a moral hazard because there aren't consequences for aiding and abetting and facilitating crimes, right? There's just no consequences at all. They're immune from responsibility. Um, and so we've got to shift that, right? We have to change the incentives. So companies are and platforms are engaging in reasonable content moderation practices that so many have been for the last 10 to 12 years, but we have outliers and they're making a heck of a lot of money and they're exploiting individuals, intimate information, especially women and minorities. And that's got to end, right? Um, part of the affirmative duties too is to shift the way that we think about protections, right? To not only restrictions against discrimination, but affirmative obligations. And some of that might mean there are just no collection zones. Right? There's some intimate information. So network sex, toy, sex toys, just to give an example of spying ink, um, will often facilitate users who are geographically separated to communicate, to send each other's real-time videos and to communicate. Now that's a great thing for lovers who are separated, but businesses shouldn't be collecting and storing that information. Not only is it really attractive for hackers to steal, but if you're sharing and selling and mining it, that's absurd. There is no reason for the legitimate use of that service that we need to collect that information. And non-consensual pornography, that should be a no collection zone. Unless you have an individual's affirmative, clear and written consent that this is pornography, right? Sites should not be permitted, they should be prohibited from collecting and using and hosting nude images and nude videos and sex videos of individuals without their ex explicit consent. And we need to change the rules of the road around and responsibility, of course, for the collection use and sharing information, shifting away from a consumer protection model to a model of rigorous protections and duties of loyalty and care that scholars like Neil Richards and Woody Hartzog have laid out. Um, so that's some of the legal kind of thinking that I have, but, but of course law can't do it all, right? Law is a blunt instrument. And so we need partnerships with tech companies. Now, right now, tech companies, their ethos, it's the hacker's ethos. It is move fast and break things and say sorry when things get mucked up. Now the hackers ethos is called like the beta test mindset is you just release, you release new products and you figure out problems later on and you fix them. It's an unacceptable approach. Would we do that with a collection of plutonium? Would we do that with the sale of cars and say, ah, just put it on the market. We'll figure out its safety afterwards. We can't do that with, with data, right? And so tech companies need to shed the hacker ethos and mindset, the beta test mindset, the move fast and break things and need to think about baking into design, privacy and security, right? Of their products 
practice and services, especially with regard to intimate privacy. We should have products and services, right? We shouldn't be the product and service. We need to change that. Something shifted in the late, you know, I'd say late 90s to the mid 2000s, where all of a sudden we became the product. That is the product and service was ancillary. It was our data that became the most interesting. And that's just got to end, right? In order, we need to construct and build services and products with privacy and safety in mind and with users' best interests in mind, with a sense of duty of loyalty and duty of care and confidentiality. So that's the, that's the sort of tech pillar, right? So here we have reform for a law. We have reform for tech companies, right? And then, you know, we're part of the, we're part of the problem, right? We, um, why is it that so many really ordinary people, frankly, they're not, you know, people in their basements or weirdos, right? Who's sharing and taking nude photos, right? They're not, they're not dysfun all dysfunctional people. Folks who have been caught were PhD students and civil servants and mayors for Pete's sakes, right? We've got an education problem and we've got to teach. We have an intractable problem of misogyny and bigotry, right? We know that that's just obvious and clear to all of us. But we also have an, as part of that, an intractable problem in which, especially when we're online, we see other people's bodies and intimate images as just a toy to play with. Like no one gets hurt, we think. And it's a game, ha ha, right? It's not, of course. There are real people behind the screens. There are real people whose Google searches are their CVs. And we've got to center them in the discussion and teach people about respect for others. We've got to teach them the values behind intimate privacy and why it matters. And, you know, maybe I can't reach folks who are older, right? They're fully entrenched. I'd love to try to help teach them but I know who we can teach are the young. We should never give up on the project of teaching people who are, let's say, um, you know, way past schooling age, way past college and grad school. Like we should not give up on the project. They're harder to reach, but we've got to teach them. But, but where we have captive audiences of young people um, engaged in education, just as Professor Rourke is bringing everyone from around, you know, people who are interested in learning, Thank you for doing it, right? Thank you for being part of the project of education. So that's all of us, like it's on us. Um, and lastly, something that I have experienced in working really closely with law enforcers and lawmakers in South Korea, Australia, and the UK, is that so often what frustrates, um, let's say the, the um, deputy minister of um, digital crime information um, has explained to me in South Korea that what's frustrating is that while they're making really serious strides against the problem of hidden cams and non-consensual pornography in their country, that so often the abuse is posted and hosted on sites based in the US. And so the frustration is I can help you with so much of the harmful material I have no jurisdiction over, right? And so there are ways in which we need to work really closely, like global cooperation is so important that South Korea was, you know, the deputy minister said, I really need contacts in the United States among law enforcement to help me take this seriously, to help put pressure on defendants to stop posting because so often the defendants are not in South Korea, they're located in the United States, I need help. And I need help connecting with platforms. So there's ways in which a lot of the changes are all iterative, right? If we change section 230 and the responsibility of online platforms, then the deputy minister of South Korea might have more ability um, and pressure that it can put on a, a platform to take down information about its own citizens posted by someone in the United States, because at least there would be ability to communicate with law enforcement on the ground and to communicate with a platform who could, couldn't say too bad, so sad, they might face um, lawsuits and enforcement on the ground in the US. And so we need some global cooperation. So that's what the, the larger prescription is about the reform agenda and it's within our grasp, right? Um, so, so lastly, I thought it and with a story of hope um, in, in the United States, for example, we've seen social movements come together and work with law enforcers and lawmakers to make change. So for two years from 2014 to 2000, um, 
and 16, I worked with then Attorney General Kamala Harris. Um, she was California AG and her executive team on the question of cyber exploitation, which is how she described non-consensual pornography. And what, what she did was bring, because um, the tech companies were all in her catchment area, right, in California, she held a meeting in San Francisco in which there were 50 tech companies around the table, advocates like myself, um, and so victims' rights groups come and, and peace officers, so representatives from law enforcement and lawmakers, state lawmakers. And we had a meeting brought together, um, and A.G. Harris had me speak and explain the problem of non-consensual pornography. She had folks from Twitter speak and Microsoft um, and a representative of, of California uh, police force, uh, peace officers. And we talked about the problem. And A.G. Harris said, listen, I can't force you to do anything companies, but this is what the harm looks like. So if you're interested, take part in our task force. And within three months of our meeting, um, Google, Bing, and Yahoo announced that they were going to take requests from victims to, to de-index photos in searches of their names. Um, Pinterest, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, um, a YouTube ban not because it's pornography, which is a big thing for victims, right? They made a commitment. State lawmakers in California changed the rules around jurisdiction so that they could have jurisdiction over, and it was permissible constitutionally, over uh, perpetrators who lived outside of their state just because so often um, perpetrators live in other states besides California. And so it was a coordinated effort. And it was social movements, right? It was it was advocates working with law enforcers with persuasion, or she would call the bully pulpit, um, A.G. Harris, now our vice president, coming together with law makers and law enforcers to make some change, modest, but still meaningful um, in the United States. Um, and we've seen some really interesting work in, um, in South Korea and in the, in the UK. Um, Gina Martin was a victim of upskirt photos and she herself like single-handedly changed the law in the UK, lobbying lawmakers um, in parliament. And, and so often they were just like, it's no big deal, you know, stop whining about this. But once she showed that even school children at private school were being secretly taped up their skirts by teachers, all of a sudden UK parliament members of parliament were like, oh, we have to deal with this. And what that started not only was the criminalization of upskirt photos in the UK, but now the UK has what they call the Commission Against Intimate Image Abuse, and they're working on a wholesale revision of the law in the UK, and I've been advising the commission. So we're seeing some really important developments on the ground. Um, so we have some hope for this project. So with that, um, Professor Work, I would I would love us to to hopefully folks have questions for us, and we can talk about the implications um, of the reform agenda, criticisms, and I I'd love to take questions. All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Danielle. <clears throat> this is not only captivating; it's modestly depressing. Uh, it's you know I have seventy five questions jotted down. Let me ask if, um, in fact, we, um, we we could start at the top. I recall yeah. back in the um, the 1960s, under kind of the direction guidance of Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. that the UN put yeah. together a Declaration of Human Rights and published right. that. Must have been about 1972 or three. Um, would it be 47 just 47 like, yep. uh earlier yep. than that yeah yep. i was i was not focused no you're good it, uh, it's just you're, you're precisely right to think about fundamental human rights yeah. um and so, civil well, rights. how do you how do you is it a good idea to try and revise that and write this in and then is it a good idea to try and use the u.n declaration to push signatories and uh nation states to come along Okay, so wonderful question. So as I'm arguing and thinking about civil rights, um, I say, look, a civil rights for the United States, a civil right, A, is it's really consonant with how we think about important and fundamental rights. Human rights, that conversation is pretty foreign to us. Um, and But a civil rights agenda has so much in common with the human rights approach to privacy. 
in the way in which it, 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 it prioritizes intimate information, there is a fundamental right, a human right to privacy that's recognized in the U European Charter of Human Rights, that's recognized in other international documents. Um, but not in the US Constitution. Not in the US Constitution. And what is what a civil right would do would be to bring privacy and intimate privacy in the way in which we understand, it would be through statute, but in the way in which we understand free speech, right? Now we have a different tradition around free speech in the First Amendment. So there, we really can't bring that proportionality analysis and exact balancing that happens in the human rights regime and human rights law. There's not a one-to-one -one analogy, right? We, um, our First Amendment doctrine um, would often prioritize privacy, free speech over privacy in lots of, in lots of instances, right? But when it comes to intimate privacy, less so, right? That is, we can square the First Amendment with lots of the protections that I'm talking about, right? The, you don't have a right to um, put up someone's nude photo without their consent if they're not a celebrity, right? It's often that, that your privacy re rights will prevail over your free speech rights because the court would say it, either the laws run through the crucible of strict scrutiny and can survive, or um, privacy rights are really important for free speech. And so those laws are really important, right? And that, that, are you citing Sullivan v. New York Times? Uh, of that course. Public yes. figures can be treated differently? Yes. It's I mean, an argument for not becoming a public figure. Uh, well, you know what's interesting too about that, Professor O'Rourke, is that Katie Hill's a perfect example of where you're a public official, right? And your nude photo is posted and shared by your vengeful ex. She's mm -hmm. a Congresswoman. Um, and then it was published by the Daily Mail and she sued recently in California trial court, uh, the Daily Mail for publishing the photos, not to writing about the story uh, that she had a, an affair right. with a campaign staffer, right? The photos. And unfortunately, unlike the European Court of Human Rights, the California court said, that the newspaper had the right to publish the photos themselves because they shed light on her character and credibility because she had slept with a stack campaign staffer. And my argument would be, you don't need to see the photos to write about that story. But as you said, New York Times were Sullivan, that kind of breathing room we, we provide, the robust marketplace of ideas, especially when it comes to public officials uh, and public figures, um, that's why the human rights and civil rights, there would be a different story, right? How it would play out. I'm not sure if I'd include us in a signatory of, of a charter of human rights. The bottom line is we'd need laws to catch up with all the nation states for us to enforce them and have commitments and it's too complicated. I don't yeah, think it's you worth know it. as well as I that technology is always going to move faster than the law and faster than law enforcement. Right. So you need yes. a, a much bigger umbrella. One of our uh, viewers mm -hmm said, and I'm quoting the question now, okay. we've seen in Europe the passage of GDPR laws. Remind us what that acronym is? Sure. It's the General Data Protection Regulation. I talked a little bit about it, but, All right. but I will as well explain as more. A, a similar law in the state of California designed to limit ad tracking and protect user privacy. How, if at all, has this kind of legislation been applied to protect uh, intimate data? Is there a carryover from that? Gosh, well, I wish. I feel like we often misunderstand the kinds of commitments, both in GDPR as well as CCPA. That's the California Consumer Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. It's not as protective as you think. So the California Consumer Privacy Act is truly uh, a procedural protections that say you can ask a company to delete your data, to not sell your data, but the presumption is collection and use and sharing. And can you imagine how hard it would be to go to all of these companies and say, delete my data, don't sell my data? Can you, can you imagine? No, <laughs> we the, can't. The IT security people right. at Domino's um, had to wait 48 hours for a video posted by one of their employees stuffing cheese up his nose and putting it on sandwiches. It was the terms of service at YouTube. Yes, that are helpful. Well, it, you cannot Could post be. something that depicts the commission of an illegal act, but it still took them 48 hours. Right. And according to Royal Pingdom, there are a couple of other sites who follow mm -hmm. this stuff. YouTube uploads 500 hours of video a every minute. minute. Yeah. So that says to me, 
um, even with high unemployment, you cannot find enough people to uh, observe all of that video. If it's 500 hours a minute, you've got to have algorithms to do it. And the companies have already admitted the algorithms don't work that well. Right. So yeah. they're depending on people to, to contact them. They don't publish an email address or a telephone number or a street address. They're depending on IT professionals to contact them and say, oh, right. please take this down. Ordinary mm -hmm. people don't have that capacity. Right. And 500 hours a minute is, yeah. uh, that's a big number. And, so, and can we note that it's 500, you know, hours a minute that they're making a whole lot of money on? Well, they wouldn't they're do not, it if they didn't make money. No, of course, right? But the idea that we're saying, oh, it's too hard, it won't scale, there aren't algorithms, they're making money off of it, figure it out. <laughs> and so right what now, you have to do, right. you know, is follow the money change, and shut the off themselves. the money supply. So go. could it could it be then that the law should focus on the resale of these things or on the ways in which they collect money for this particular product? Right, there are a number of ways that we can do this, right? And and I'm not entirely sure like a tax on the advertising model is necessarily like gonna get us all the way because we're still probably gonna have a harm even if they give the US government a cut of those sales. The question is how do we structure the incentives so that we minimize the harm, right? Well, uh, Danielle, that put a dent in the sale of cigarettes. You know, a carton of cigarettes is $50 and in some cases- uh, some and, and who's buying them? Yeah, Who's, people who can least afford it. People who can least afford it, right? And we see the same kind of disparate harm play out, right? I think that's a great way to think about it, right? Is we still see the harm, right? Yeah. It's still going to fall on disadvantaged folks. Uh, and so I would just, I, I think we don't have a silver bullet in the law, right? But right now the incentives are to collect, use, and share it and to, to especially to escalate sharing right through algorithms mm. um, because it makes so much money, right? And yeah. there isn't, there aren't sort of speed bumps or requirements for reasonable behavior that I want us to reintroduce. Yeah, reasonable behavior. No. You know, I, I think when yeah. people have done truly dumb things, particularly chief executives of large organizations, I have said to several of them personally, you know what I really feel like doing right now and I had one of them look back at me, and this was at a cocktail reception in New York. He said, yeah. what, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna call your mother and I'm gonna tell her what you're up to. Yeah. And, and all the people- And are all of a sudden yeah. people are like, oh, maybe I should really, yeah. it's like that kind of individual yeah. shaming. You know what I'm saying, right? Because the market's not doing that. The market is I'm just not as exciting heavy guns as we and think. Get your mama to talk to you. You know what, so, maybe couple, something would happen. A couple of other things. Uh, let's go back to section 230 that protects Absolutely. the um, social media and internet platforms from harm of any sort to themselves because the content belongs to the guy who posted it. Yep, yep. Um, you use the phrase reasonable content moderation practices and you would exempt certain categories uh, in order to leave 230, not as it is, but in modified form. Help yep. me understand what reasonable content moderation sure. practices look like. Yep, yep, yep. You know, you often think of reasonableness in, a, in the law as reflective of norms and safety practices that exist, right? So reasonableness is is a jury's determination. Oh, the reasonable what, man standard. Right, of, of, of the kinds of safety practices we either see already or want to valorize and reinforce. Now, since I've been working on this for the past 12 years with companies, both for Twitter's Trust and Safety Task Force and Facebook's Naga Central Intimate Imagery Task Force, but of course not without any, comp I'm not compensated. It's, I get to criticize these companies because I, refuse to take any money from them. We've seen practices, safety practices on the ground. There's an entire, there is an entire professional association devoted to online safety. So you said, well, what would that constitute, right? Yeah. And first things first is having terms of service, clear rules of road that you publish and explain and clarify in detail to your user community, right? Having modes of accountability that the process is what happens when there's a terms of service violation. What is the process of reporting abuse 
What's the process that the provider is going to go through? And layers of review, right, and accountability. And it's not just that, right? Those are procedural requirements, having been clear right. about what your processes are, what's your modes of accountability. And that's just, that's of course, just ground basic requirements, right? And having a real process of review, right? Those, that's just bound ground truth. But what's so helpful about a reasonableness approach is that, because I've worked on this issue, various issues with these companies, is that it allows companies and it forces them to innovate. Because as you said really well, the threats change. The threat vector changes in two seconds, right? And it's it, it, the, the sort of the bad guys are always, or women are, are, are steps ahead of, of the f- folks who are harmed, right? And the law enforcers. And so what a reasonableness standard would do is put pressure on companies not to rest on their laurels and say, yeah, we got terms of service. We've got modes of, you know, we have ways to block filter speech, but we're gonna innovate, right? to deal with new forms and new ways of getting around our protection. So I I have a great example um, for Facebook's intimate imagery approach that for years was just based, as you said, really well on user complaints, right? So user goes to Facebook and says, please take down this photo. It's not consensual intimate imagery. They'll take it down. It comes back up, right? And what, what Facebook figured out three, four years ago in consultation with experts, including Hani Fareed, um, was to use hashes that Hani had created this technology in co- conjunction with Microsoft, photo DNA, which is like a fingerprint for photos and video, right? That would prevent people from reposting videos and photos that have already been taken down. You know, the problem of whack a mole mm-hmm. is addressed with photo DNA. And so that innovation. Facebook took on, it was in their interest. They ban, they, they ban nudity. So they didn't need a change to 230 to get them to do that, right? It was in their interest. They ban nudity. They wanted to do this and they have great inside folks, Antigone Davis and Karuna Naim, who are staffers at Facebook who care about this issue. And so they took on innovation themselves. I want law to help us push everyone to do that. Well, that's interesting. My conversations with people primarily on the West Coast fall into two groups. One group is in radio silence mode. They're not even Mm. talking to their family. They are, uh, as a friend of mine put it, under the table sucking their thumbs. They don't know what to do, right? There are others, and, you know, I would say uh, Tim Cook may be leading the parade here, who has said um, that this is all now opt in rather than opt out. We're yeah. going to make it easy for you to protect your data. Yeah. And what the people at Apple are yep. telling me is, yep. Yep. Um, Jim, we've looked at the two regulatory models yep. being discussed. And in yep. the United States, the regulatory model, you know, what's old is new again. You know, it's the break yeah. them up, the old yeah, yeah. antitrust model. Make them so small that they don't have trillions of dollars in cash and fungible assets Mm -hmm. and feel immune. That actually doesn't frighten anyone in Silicon Valley just now Mm. because they'll still Mm. have stock control. They'll find ways to, you know, divert the cash flow. The, The model that seems to concern them is the one I saw in the UK when Mr. Zuckerberg came over in Mm -hmm. 2018. Um, I I was over at Whitehall and um, the idea was they want to regulate them as a public utility. So you no longer report to a uh, board of directors whose financial interests are principally being driven by your your value proposition. They want you to report to a public utility commission very much like um, you know, the water yeah. company or the gas company. And yes. so um, is the question comes down to this, is mm. the internet now a public utility? So I think the answer, you know, it, the metaphors matter. So the way that the ways that we think about these tools, we have right now preset metaphors that they're not that many, right? We have the public utility model. We have the, you know, model of everything at the content layer. It should just be free, right? We have, we have ways that we think about like the radio, right? right. Um, uh, you know, mass media, cable, 
And a lot of those models like are of a different time. So I think the sure. problem with a public utility model, that kind of um, that kind of reporting and review by a commission actually sounds quite brilliant, right? The problem though as well, though it comes with it, if we think about it exactly as a public utility, they can't do any moderating at all, right? Because like, you know, the phone company, you know, Jim, they can't listen to our phone call. <laughs> right. Thankfully so. And that's because without they a have bench to warrant. Right. No, right. Without without, you know, the super warrant, right, of the Wiretap Act. But the thing is, right, we want them to moderate, you know, and so the the precise metaphor of the public utility has really interesting features. Mm. But maybe we borrow from all the different features, right? It's not a precise, I think, useful tool, because when we say the non-discrimination model, it matters which layer of the stack you're on, right? Yeah. And at the content layer, I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> I'm not using Facebook or Twitter if it's filled with neo-Nazi content, right? Abuse, yeah. threats, harassment, stalking, and nudity. I'm, I'm, not, I'm out, right? right? But at different layers of the stack and control and power, the approach to regulation should be different. I have a question I would like to uh, leave with sent to us by uh, a young woman who clearly is concerned, and I will read you yeah. her words. What kind of regulations might be effective in deterring men from engaging with online pornography and the sex trade online? Yeah. Um, my quick answer to that is this is a demand supply issue. You can eliminate the supply, yeah. but I'm not sure the demand goes away. Mm. Yeah. South Korea has banned many adult yep. sites, yet yep. prostitution is 4% of their GDP. Yeah. As a young woman, she writes, I yeah. often feel pretty deep resentment towards men of my generation. Yeah. It feels like nothing can be done. Yeah. So um, is, is that really true? Can nothing be done? Or is this really a kind of moral societal issue um yeah that, that we do we go back to their mothers uh, yep i'm going to show you something that's just so in line with what our wonderful questioner has asked and i don't know if you can see it no. but this is the ad that south korean police put up um, um about to dissuade people from engaging in mocha and basically they describe the see these little young boys they look like little immature kids yep. the ad basically said we're the premise behind the ad was like folks engaging in in hidden cameras they're like little kids they're juveniles let's te let's tease them they'll stop now that was the wrong approach right your questioner asks how do we deter this kind of misogyny that's baked into this idea of boys being boys it's juvenile antics and it's something this the deputy minister in south korea of um digital sex crime information is working on he said that was a mistake right we need to work on education, right? Because misogyny and bigotry aren't an inevitability. It's just, we have to work on it. We have to work on really hard, unfortunately, right? And you're right. The reason why I call it a civil right um, is because it has the moral salience, right? It says, this is not a joke. It's not, a, it's not something that we can deter with silly ads. This is about our core capabilities, right? Um, and the exploitation of vulnerable people's and often women's bodies. And so I, I think let's not give up on the project. Let's keep trying. Uh, Danielle Citron, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been wonderful. This has been an eight part series with so many of your friends, um, Hani Farid and several others who have joined us. And of course, we'll do this again next spring, different topic. Um, I, I almost have it all together and we'll make the announcement very soon about that topic. But uh, from Mark McKenna and the law school and all your friends here at Notre Dame, thank you for all you do. And thanks for joining us and sharing both your time and expertise. And thanks it's to our pleasure. viewers. Good to have you here. Uh, if you have questions, uh, direct them to the course director or to me and uh, we'll We'll make sure we respond to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for being part of what we're doing here. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.